When we were researching this episode, Amy, you found a great article from the New York Times about how sports nicknames are disappearing. Like we don't have a magic anymore or refrigerator anymore. Uh, remember that one from when I was a kid. But right. Many of those nicknames were given by journalists and they help propel the athlete's stories into our everyday conversations. So if you were a sports figure, Amy, what nickname would the journalist give you? I, I appreciate this question, Holland, but I noticed that you haven't given yours either. So you may have to tap in here. I want to hear what your nickname would be. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you a minute to think about it. But, you know, I grew up during a season when we were as little girls watching Olga Corbett fly through the air. I mean, just to me still to this day, one of the most amazing gymnasts in history. And um, she had a nickname. The, and hers was the Sparrow from Minsk. And so I'm not sure what my nickname would be, but maybe the Pigeon from Arlington, because I didn't make it far um, from my roots as a gymnast. I can tumble, but that's about it. I tell you, I, uh, I got to write a little bit for a gymnast in Asia, and she's now on The Apprentice. Wow. Um, yeah, she is. She's, she told me that gymnastics is the mother of all sports. I don't doubt it. Anyway, sports stories and figures really are larger than life, and they make a massive impact in our world. Sports defines, or maybe a better word is illustrates, the various narratives of economics and global politics, sexual identities. The things we talk about in uh, serious conversation often get reflected in sports. Oh, that is so true. It is a microcosm of the world. And the people who report on sports are creating a story about a lot more than just that person who sunk the ball through the hoop and when someone landed the perfect 10. So on the this episode of The Afterward, that's exactly what we're talking about. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Boland. And you're listening to The Afterward, a conversation about the future of words. We have Dr. Brian Denham, Professor of Sports Communication at Clemson University. Welcome. Thank you. Go Tigers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and adding to the ensemble tonight, we have Matt Marine, a sports journalist with WACH Fox 57 in Columbia. And this is Columbia, South Carolina, right? That's correct, though I am a Columbia, Missouri, University of Missouri grad, so Go Tigers works for me, too. There hey, go. there we go. I love when we have this kind of equity. Awesome. Okay, but what you have personal stories about how you got into this world. In just 60 seconds each, would you mind sharing the Cliff Notes version of your life and who you are? We'll start with you, Brian. Okay. Uh, well, I went to Indiana University uh, for uh, journalism and uh, as a walk-on in soccer for a little while and uh, had some shoulder dislocations and issues like that. So I got started learning more about kinesiology and always kept my interest in, in journalism and communication. Went out to the West Coast for grads for a master's degree at Cal State Fullerton and back to Tennessee for PhD and uh, have sort of looked at the intersection between sport and politics in addition to the more physical aspects, the kinesiology and science of muscle movement type of stuff in sports sociology. So kind of a mixed bag. I'm uh, somewhat eclectic in my interests, but that's basically it. As, as for me, yeah, I, I played soccer as well. Can't claim the same walk-on uh, status that Brian had, but at a certain point, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, and elected to go study at the University of Missouri, like I mentioned earlier, for their journalism school, which is the oldest journalism school in the country. Uh, from there, I, I worked at the NBC affiliate station in Columbia, Missouri, that is a partnership with the university uh, called KOMU. From there, upon graduation, went down to Springfield, Missouri, to work for the CBS affiliate down there, uh, Color 10. And most recently, in the last couple months, have now transitioned back to my home state of South Carolina, uh, here in Columbia, working for Watch. 57, watch Fox. Uh, so kind of have made my way now in a full circle back to the Palmetto State. My first job uh, out of graduate school was at SMS. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, now Missouri State, that's, that was our main thing yeah. we covered out there in Springfield. Yeah. So yikes. Really we have liked got it a lot. Everybody connected except for me. I am not connected to you all at all. 
I grew up in the Washington DC area, um, Northern Virginia. So I'm, I'm not connected here, but I love these stories already. This is fabulous. But you know, um, both of you with your stories and your history, I mean, goodness gracious, uh, Holland, I'm already feeling like we're in the presence of experts here, mm-hmm. just background and their expertise. Um, not everybody has that background though. So let's, let's do a little quick fire definition round to help us um, not feel like we're uh, behind the ball. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other sports analogies, uh, euphemisms, whatever. Um, But let's toss this one out. Anyone want to take, what is the golden age of sports writing? Matt, I'll defer to you on that. I think we we both agree talking ahead of this that mm-hmm. most people would probably say the 1920s was a time in which there was a bit of fatigue from war as well as a booming economy. And, and you know, people were looking for an escape. And that's where you see baseball as a national pastime in, in Babe Ruth and everything. That's probably what most people would answer. But I think that golden age is, you know, it's an opinionated thing. And as media has changed, sports writing has turned into sports reporting. And you'd probably get 10 different answers from 10 different reporters. Anything else to add to that, Brian? I agree that it, it would be subjective. Some people okay. would say, well, when Sports Illustrated first got going, Henry Luce decided to develop it and it started to see sports writing as more almost literature in some ways, uh, that there were the best writers at that point contributing to that magazine. That was closer to the 50s, I believe. Fascinating. But, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, 20s is generally regarded. You know. Okay. All right. How about this one? And um, Brian, you kind of tapped into this a little bit already with your intro, sports psychology. What are we talking about? Sports psychology would use just psychological principles to help athletes stay in the moment uh, as opposed to worrying about what the fans are thinking or what have you. A sports psychologist would work with athletes toward developing like a routine for putting a golf ball or shooting a free throw. Okay. So they would stay in that moment and then the, the muscle movement would be the same. But uh, it's not uh, my friend who's a sports psychologist used to joke that it's not a place for athletes to go and <laughs> like a typical uh, psychologist. So, okay. You know, uh, sport excellence and staying in the moment, learning to focus on personal excellence as opposed to quote winning, which is often out of your control. And so a lot of uh, the John Wooden, the great UCLA yeah. basketball coach, he was sort of at the front of this, at the forefront mm. of this. Mm. Yeah. And the late Pat Summit at Tennessee, the women's yeah. basketball coach, she was yeah. very much into sports psychology. Yeah. Great examples. Great examples. Anything else, Matt? No, I'm going to defer to the professor on, on the definition of sports psychology here. He's, he's well <laughs> okay. more studied than I am. Okay. Okay. Uh, the only thing that comes up to me when you all are talking is the Ted Lasso episode about him telling the soccer player to be a goldfish, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, goldfish have a 10 second, you know, memory, you know, so that to me would be sports psychology. Huh. Not bad. Not bad. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, performance enhancement. What? I think this is, feels a little icky. What is it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, that generally refers to probably, um, you know, enhancement drugs that are used by by a lot of athletes in order to uh, play better. You saw it a lot in steroids in the baseball world and just things that build muscle mass and your ability to, you know, strengthen your game to put you above. Usually most of these things are illegal in the sports world, um, though those things are always shifting and the science is always changing on, on what is and what isn't within the rules. You probably see different rules for each sport along the way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. Um, there are, uh, I happen to be working on a history project in sports journalism right now and looking at a 1970 series in Sports Illustrated. And the author talked about uh, restorative and additive substances. So okay. Restorative would help to ease pain and things like that, reduce inflammation. But additive would be, say, steroids or even amphetamines, things that would help you perform in sport beyond what you could do. That's a great uh, differentiation because I think, you know, when I think about being hurt as an athlete running or something, and I put, you know, orthotics in my shoes, to me, that's restorative. It's not necessarily going to, you know, enhance necessarily my performance, but it is going to help me be able to run. 
but taking the steroids in order to run faster, then that would be additive. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Oh, I love this. Okay. Yeah. Digital sports journalism. Huh? That's Matt. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's literally me because it's pretty much all I've ever really known. I'm, I mean, I'm only 26. And so throughout my whole life, journalism and sports journalism have existed within a digital sphere. And maybe early on TV was more supreme before that you would have seen other mediums, but right now it's a digital first atmosphere, meaning that journalism is being made and created directly to go onto the internet and be consumed uh, through that medium, as opposed to what you would see on, on TV, radio, or in the paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing that a lot right now with the Olympics, the, the ratings are not very good, but that doesn't mean they're no good because there's a lot of internet activity going on. Okay. And, uh, Absolutely. That's a good point. A lot of the athletes are actually very active on TikTok right now. I don't know if any of you are on that, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Sean White, you know, a noted snowboarding legend, is, has made a name for himself on TikTok, showing kind of the behind the scenes of what it's like to be an athlete in Olympic Village right now and what's going on in China. So any app, any website, there's coverage on there. Okay. Yeah. I think um, um, the young lady that just won the, the one of the snowboarding events, gold medal. Oh, Kim? Yeah. She it sent an Instagram like at her landing. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, yeah. how do you have your phone with you at the at the Olympics and taking a picture of your landing? Yeah, that's amazing. All right. This one sounds interesting. What is sports law? Well, it, it depends on whether you're talking about, uh, you know, whether teams should be able to serve alcohol in stadiums or have people run on the field after games all the way over to the policy arena about uh, what should be permitted in terms of substance use and uh, dietary supplements, for example. And you see all we're seeing it right now with the uh, major league baseball and the threat of strike and how they butt heads. And uh, yeah. so collective bargaining, all of these kinds of activities, Matt's probably covered some of these types of stories. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it also gets in the realm of, you know, the regulation of the, the committees and everything that oversees these, everything from youth sports and what they're allowed to do and not do to amateur to the collegiate level and the NCAA right. all the way up to pros. You're dealing with different rules at every different level within every different sport. And so without getting into the weeds of every mm -hmm. single one of those laws, it's, it's kind of just an overarching term uh, for all of the legality that happens within the sports world, which is a ton. Yes. Yeah. I'm, and, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking even down to your peewee baseball and your high school football. And there's also the, uh, like in baseball, there's the antitrust exemption. And it seems like every time there's a problem, the threat of revoking it comes into the conversation. Um, and mm. there's probably no authority by the people making that threat to do so, but they do it anyway. And okay. it's interesting with the, the antitrust, uh, the original case was, well, baseball is inherently competitive. If you only have one team, there is no competition. So it has no value. One team has no value. So it should be exempt. There has to be competition. Makes sense. Well, this was fascinating. I feel much um, better to um, take the field, if you will, um, in this conversation. So thank you. There are so many sports puns we could make as we're going through this. I don't know. I know, Holland. My brain's going a mile a minute. We probably aren't the two people that should have been entrusted with this topic. Maybe not. I'd like to go back just a little bit to a couple of things that we've talked about. We mentioned digital broadcasting. We mentioned... Um, golden age of sports writing. Could you just take us on a journey from the first sports media, uh, newspaper, radio, uh, all the way up to 2022? 
Sure. I mean, I guess early on you would have seen in that, you know, 20s and before in newspapers, it was probably more focused on box scores and stat lines that would be placed in there simply to recap for people uh, who weren't able to make it actually the game. But from there is consumer uh, habits changed and technology updated. You see that shift forward into, you know, more radio and broadcasts of the game into television and broadcasting of the game, as well as reports on, on nightly news broadcasts. Then you go into more of the 24 Four hour news cycle, which changed it again as you know, ESPN entered the realm, Sports Center changed it. And as those came in, you saw a shift from more of the news angle of it to personalities and, and human interest stories that ESPN became kind of the template for that others and you know other media groups had to follow. And now you talk about the digital sphere as we move forward and blogs that started coming up, forcing, you know, uh, Bill Simmons to start the ringer and the athletic. Now, most of the writers who I graduated with went into not newspaper writing, but the digital realm and, and working for places like the athletic and going onto Twitter and putting news first there. So you've seen kind of a shift as wherever the eyeballs are, throughout history that's where it's gone and it's become more about the athletes behind the scenes and the human interest of them as much as it is about who wins or loses a game yeah sports writing has certainly uh had a an interesting uh evolution like i'm in magazines in particular i'm very interested in sports illustrated and uh, how it evolved and uh the way they covered different sports in 1950s and some of the 60s the uh, sports were golf and horse racing and some of the, uh, they were really emphasized. Try now it's football and basketball and baseball to some extent, although there has been some increase in interest in soccer or football, if you will. That's That's interesting. Uh, You said something there, Matt, about uh, what is it? It's gone where the eyeballs are, something like that. Sports reporting has gone where the eyeballs are. So- Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, sports journalism is at least behind the scenes. Once you go beyond the reporter to the sales teams that are back behind it, it's about what makes the most money is where they're going to dedicate the resources and and everything. And so that's where you've seen as the technology has shifted and the consumer habits have shifted with that you've seen journalism follow through. You saw it early on, honestly, with even some mistakes as it went to the internet, most journalists and journalism communities started putting their stuff up for free on the internet. And that quickly became a problem with consumer habits because suddenly the expectation was that it was free. And then when places like the New York Times try and put up a paywall in order to earn money for the work they've done, you see consumers get a little upset at that, even though that's probably just what should happen in the first place. So there was never an expectation. So it's kind of a live and learn as each new technology step goes. But journalists have to be right there because journalism is kind of the the first draft of history. So if you're not right where the eyeballs are the first time out, you're in the wrong spot. No, one of the interesting uh, occurrences now in, in sports writing or any type of uh, journalism is that with Twitter and some of the social media, journalists will sometimes, not always, but sometimes interact with readers. So if a reader leaves a comment that he maybe it may offend a, a writer or is particularly insightful, all of a sudden you see a comment from the writer of the article when that would never have happened, of course, in prior times where you might get a letter to the editor or something to put in the paper. So the times have really changed in that respect. Yeah. This notion of community and, and mm-hmm. symbio- symbiosis. Yeah. And, and that could be good and bad, you know, yeah. there's, there's nothing like a good Twitter war. Um, and so that can be, I'm just kidding. Yeah, some don't want to, want to involve themselves in it. And for that exact reason, let's talk about some of the perspectives that aren't being heard, because there are some voices and places where eyeballs aren't, as Matt said. And I, I really do love that phrase that they go where the eyeballs are. I think that's just spot on. So what are some perspectives that are, are, are missing right now in sports journalism, Brian? Well, I think... Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is the nature of problems that sometimes creep into sports journalism or are covered, for example, drugs and sports. They, if you look at the history of the way that's been covered, 
different sports tend to pop up at different times as having an alleged drug problem, but it doesn't really mean that any other time is any different. So it's just, boom, we're going to study baseball now in 2002 because it was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and it's a big expose and it's caused a lot of controversy. But that doesn't mean that that problem did not exist in the 1990s or after, right? So okay. I think it's important that when, when, at least when I'm covering these things or studying them, uh, to note that a problem may just emerge, but it doesn't mean it wasn't going on or will not continue to go on. Uh, that's an issue that, that always okay. comes up. That's a great Beyond point. Beyond just but... historical perspective, I think that just either you see a lack of diversity in backgrounds of people who get into sports journalism because there's a certain paywall just to go to college and the amounts of tens of thousands of dollars that costs in order to go to get a degree that when you get out, it's not paid that much right now because most of the old mediums and television and newspaper aren't making as much money because like we said, that's not where the eyeballs are. As things shift to more digital, those advertisements don't make as much revenue for the companies. And a lot of that has been put on the salaries of the reporters themselves. And so if you think about the types of people who'd be able to fork over $50,000 to go to college only to be paid $30,000 once they get out of that four-year degree, there aren't going to be many people who are going to have the level of support from, from parents who are able to achieve that. And beyond that, just within the sports world in particular, I think that a lot of times there's still a mindset that that is a man's world. And mm -hmm. so you see a distinct lack of female representation and perspective in sports, which granted is changing as we're seeing it. There's more of an emphasis. I think just uh, last week as we're recording this episode was National Women's in Sports Day, uh, which is a thing that there's been a lot more emphasis placed on. And you've seen better hiring practices uh, for people who aren't white straight men, which have been the predominant demographic of sports journalists reporters. And as the digital sphere expands as well, that allows more access for people who want to get into it, who maybe don't have the degree background or the monetary ability to enter it the normal, you know, traditional way. Yeah. Excellent points. Excellent points. Just love that. Not everybody can be an Andrew Cotter and start instead of, um, you know, broadcasting um, golf matches, do, you know, commentary on his two dogs and then write a book. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you not everybody gets that that opportunity. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Well, what are some of the other uh, issues or trends or even policies that are affecting um, media coverage of sports? Well, I, I think that, you know, it's always going to follow just what the issues are outside of sports media. The same things that are important there are important within sports. So right now, COVID is a huge discussion point within sports that's determining not just how we cover sports, but what's going on within them as sports as games get canceled. I mean, there was a year stretch where there wasn't really even a game going on. And for us in sports offices, the stretch every day to come in and come up with a new story outside of that was incredibly difficult. And on top of that, you've seen, you know, social movements as far as Black Lives Matter and racism has always been prevalent in sports. You've seen it recently with what Colin Kaepernick in 20. 16 and the police, you know, brutality and racism there. You've seen it even just this year in 2022 is Brian Flores, the former head coach of the Miami Dolphins, um, has alleged racism in hiring practices across basically the entire NFL. And so those things have been huge, as well as collegiate pay has been a major discussion point right now. You have the NIL name image likeness which for those who don't know is a new initiative for collegiate athletes to be able to get money based on their brand as an athlete before the NCAA said, if you're making any money on anything, a YouTube channel, whatever you're breaking NCAA rules and you're not allowed to do that. Now that door has been opened a bit more and athletes are able to get some money, hopefully as, as it is because they were making zero dollars while the college was making millions. And even the grad student in the school store was making 14 an hour for selling the kid's jersey. So you're seeing that as a discussion point and, and everything that's going on in the real world happens in sports as well. Yes. And some of the sports traditionalists are, are, are sort of upset about NIL and, and the uh, transfer portal and how things are changing in sports and it's empowering the athlete more and they want it back to how it was uh where they everybody committed to a 
a school. And uh, there was an article in one of the uh, newspapers or magazines about how college football coaches used to be institutions in themselves. And now they're sort of going where the money is. Now, I, I thought that it's kind of unfair and that people may really want to go to those places. It's it, and they're already being paid a fortune. Then they're going to get paid an even greater fortune to go somewhere else. So it's they've, football coaches have been portrayed lately as just sort of going where the money is, I think, <laughs> maybe unfairly. Uh, but it's true. Wow. These are such good um, insights and things that I would not have considered because I'm, I, you, again, like you were saying, Matt, I mean, the things that happen outside in our world do occur within the, this microcosm. And that was one of our first points earlier is that sports is a microcosm. Um, and so I just think that's a, an interesting reflection. So as we so, close. So is it fair to say, Brian, that Clemson is paying Dabo more than they're paying you? <laughs> I'd say that's uh, fair. <laughs> okay. Oh, Holland, you had to get that one in. Oh, hey, he's done well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have to put a, 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 a little stop. We're going to take a time out, if you will, um, for this episode. And would you please, before we close out this episode, Brian, will you give us an essential element to something we need to understand sports journalism? Well, I think you look. You need to look to the news values of things like uh, conflict and celebrity and uh, proximity, and uh, those things determine what will be reported. And more and more, it seems like celebrity is is an overarching uh, news value in many uh, parts of the news operation, not just sports, but uh, personalities seem to be. Uh, really popular right now. If you look to social media and all the influencers, just the personality uh, okay. is so important. Interesting. What about you, Matt? Uh, I would I would second that. I think that right now you have more voices and reporters in sports journalism than we've ever had before because of the digital realm and the number of people who can get into it. So as part of that, you're not expected to be able to absorb all of that. If you're trying to get into consuming sports journalism, what you want to do is find the people who are talking about the things that you care about, and then maybe find them on Twitter or something. That's where a lot of that personality that Brian was talking about comes through. Find the ones who resonate with you, not necessarily agree with you. You don't want to put yourself in an echo chamber when you're consuming media. You want to find people who just challenge your notions and put forward interesting ideas and then dive deeper into whoever they are. If they're on Twitter, but they're also a reporter on TV, tune into that channel. If they're in the newspaper, get a subscription. Find wherever they're putting out their native content and go to there. But the digital sphere is a great place to weed it down and find the personalities, like Brian was saying, that you most resonate with. So right. are you all talking about personalities of the athletes and the and sort of a celebrity, or are you talking about the personality of the reporter? Yeah, it could be journal. both. Uh, either one. Uh, a lot of folks who call, who call games, let's say, who are up in the booth, in addition to play-by-play, -play, they like a high-profile athlete to be right there to discuss the game. And uh, so the, the bigger the name the better the draw in many cases. Uh, so, but celebrity culture, I think, uh, can't be overlooked. It's athletes are celebrities. They're in GQ. They're on the cover of GQ all the time. They're uh, modeling. They're uh, doing commercials for other products. It, it, they are a major uh, player, so to speak, in society. So, I though, really, Colin, you, you hit an interesting point in saying because we have a far more access to the athletes now through that digital sphere than we had before. So you don't just have to learn about the teams through journalists. You can follow the athletes on Twitter and they may not give you as much as, you know, the in-depth stuff. But every once in a while, it, it comes out huge that news breaks on there from direct an athlete before it ever gets to a reporter. And so following the athletes you care about can teach you just as much as following the reporters who talk about them. Yes. Hmm. Um, once in a while, an athlete will, will pull a trick or two on social media, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they will open an account and refer to themselves in the third person. 
as though they re were reporting on themselves. Um, and so if they're trying to manage a crisis, they can make up some name of this person and report essentially on themselves by discussing themselves in the third person. Uh, and uh, there are a few athletes who've tried that as approaches. I don't know if it was any, if it was successful, <laughs> but they gave it a shot. I don't know. This sounds, this sounds like um, our definition earlier about performance enhancement, whether this is restorative or additive. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, special thanks to Matt and Brian. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, while you wait for part two, please go to theafterwardpodcast.com and become a subscriber. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us. And as always, remember that you are welcome at our table. 